before we start, can I ask everybody to, wherever you're sitting, uh, sit straight so that your back is straight. By that, I mean your spine is, you know, erect, aligned in a straight line, vertical. And just breathe. Breathe in, pause for a short while, and then breathe out. What I said to you about breathing, the length you breathe in, the length you breathe out must be witnessed by a short pause right? of, at, of at least minimum 10 seconds. So breathe in, wait for 10 seconds, and then breathe out to the same extent of the inhalation. So inhalation, pause, exhalation, inhalation, pause, exhalation, until it becomes a regular cycle. This is called prana kriya, the practice of breathing, taking of air and discharge of air. Very important. It's like, you know, in medical terminology, you have dialysis, right? So it's like that. So it's very, very important for us to regulate the breathing. Hari hi om ganana altwa ganapadi gum hava mahe kavyo kavi namu bhamasravastamam jeshthara jam brahmanam brahmanas patha anashan vannu devisse dasadano prano devi saraswati vaje virvaji nivati Dinama Mitra Yavato Ganesha Yanamaha Saraswatya Namaha Sri Guru Pyo Namaha Arihi Om Om Gajana Nambu the Ganadi Sevidam Kapita Jumbo Balazara Bakshitam Omasudam Soka Vinashakaranam Namami Vignesh Varavada Bangajam Gajananam Mahakayam Vitnarajam Vinayam Vishpesham Vishpeshaksham Ganeshayam Namol Namahavam Guru Brahma Guru Vishnu Guru Devo Maheshwaraha Guru Sakshat Parabrahma Tashme Shri Gurave Namaha Gurave Sarbalokanam Visajeva Varojanahan the years of Vidyanam Sri Dakshinamurta Yenamaha Om Zahana Bhavatu Zahana Bonatu Zahavit Yam Garavahai Tejaspina Badi Tamas Tumavit Vishavahai Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsatri Heshwarar Panamas Tu Zat Guru Jaranabindha Bhyam Namon Namaha Om Sairam and welcome to the third session or the final session of the three sessions, which is uh, preparatory for us to be launched into the 18 Puranas, which will begin after this week, not next week, but week after. More about that, more about that towards the end. But today we're looking at chakras. Now, if I can just backtrack a little bit, I started with, you know, mantra, yantra, and tantra. And last week, I looked at the panchakoshas, but this week, I'm looking at the chakras. Now, all of this relates to the individual self. How you can use these knowledge or these tools to engender yourself in spiritual growth. Or spiritual evolution. So go from one stage of consciousness to another stage of consciousness and then from that state, evolved state of consciousness to reach the higher peaks of cosmic consciousness where you become one with the cosmos, with the universe, with the energy that reverberates in the universe, which is what we refer to as Brahman, Parabrahman. 
supreme Brahman, right? It's the cosmic energy. Okay. So coming back to the chakras, you see, the chakras is not a new 20th century or 19th century or 18th century or 17th century or 16th century. It goes back. It goes back as early as the discovery of the Vedas. I don't know. You know, when I did the Upanishads, I gave you a timeline for each of the Upanishads and an estimated timeline of when the Vedas are actually discovered, right? They range from 5,000 to 25,000 years BC, right? Before the actual calendars were introduced. So you can imagine that this concept has been there, lying there latent all along until people in different times, in different era have discovered, oh, I've tripped on this knowledge and said, hey, this is something great. And then they focus on it. And that focus then became the focus of subsequent uh, discoverers or discoveries. So it is not a new discovery. It's always been there, right? And it's been sort of monopolized in different times in different era by different people. Of course, now it exists as a concept, right, in the West. And it exists as courses which are sold to many, 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 many people across the globe as a course, right? That, of course, it goes back to the early traditions of Hinduism. Of course, uh, there is a lot of, uh, you know, extraction of this into uh, the Buddhist faith, into the Jain faith, into the Christian faith, into the, um, um, what do you call, into the Islamic faith, yes. If you research, you will see the connection there into uh, Jainism, I probably mentioned, um, into uh, Confucianism and Taoism. It is also there, you know, this chakra. Now, if you look at the early Sanskrit texts or the early Sanskrit writings, they are seen as meditative visualizations, meditative visualizations, which combines two things. One is like the different levels of the blossoming of a flower coupled with a mantra, right? So meditative visualization of a combination of flower and mantra existing as physical entities in the body. That was the early, uh, you know, um, early reference to chakras in the early texts, right? Then, of course, you had the uh, yoga sutras. They came in and they, when they spoke about dhyana yoga, right? They spoke about nine chakras, right? Two invisible ones and seven that most of you know about, right? So you have the seven, you know, from the Muladhara to the Sudhisthana to the Manipura to the Anahata to the Vishuddha to the Agnya to the Sasrara, right? But there is one above and there is one below, right? So that makes it nine. So two invisible ones, it's just like the rainbow, you know? You've got two invisible colors, isn't it? And you got the, the main colors. So the one above the Sahasrara is called the soul chakra, the soul chakra or the soul star chakra, soul star chakra. And the one beneath the feet, there is one beneath the feet, right? You know, the chakras end at the, uh, what do you call, um, at, the, at, the, at the root base level, which is Muladhara, yeah, the root chakra. But there is the one that is invisible is below that, below the feet. That is called the earth star chakra. So the earth star chakra and the soul star chakra are two invisible ones. And in between you have the seven chakras. This is referred to in the yoga sutras. Okay, yoga sutras. And then of course, you know, the, 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 the talk about kundalini, right? And there's a lot of confusion about kundalini, right? Kundalini is a separate thing altogether, but within the awakening of the Kundalini Shakti, Shakti is of course energy, right? So Kundalini is a type of energy that has the power to envelop and coil around the seven chakras, right? I'll talk to you more about that. Now Kundalini Shakti is techniques about breathing exercises, uh, visualization, the different mudras, you know, 
all this, uh, the bandhas, the kriyas, all this talks about, again, uh, you can also go back to yantra or mantra or tantra. All this can help with awakening the kundalini, kundalini shakti. Okay. I'll tell you how it is connected with chakra. So people always get confused with kundalini and chakra. Anyway, of the seven chakras, the root, the muladhara, the spleen and the solar plexus, so this tana and the manipura, they are called lower chakras. That means below the chest. They are called, the three chakras are called low, lower chakras. That above the chest, the heart, anahata, the throat, vishuddha, the third eye, agnya, and the crown is sahasrara. These four are called upper chakras. So you have the lower chakras and you have the upper chakras. And don't forget, I said the soul star, which is invisible above, and the earth star, which is invisible below your feet. So when you connect, and when you connect at a certain vibration, you have a full circle. You have a full circle around you, head to toe. You know? And you are inside that circle. And that circle, talking about, you know, cosmic traveling can take you, you know, to different astro planes. Now, that is the ancient reference going back to the Veda, specifically in the Rig Veda, right? If you want chapter and verse, I'll tell you in a minute or two. Um, the modern Western references to chakra came from multiple authors, but they all started in the uh, in the second decade of the 19th century. So the first book that has got some global recognition is by one by the British author, Sir John Woodruff, uh, back in 1919, if I'm not mistaken. And he called it the serpent power. Now, of all titles, one must wonder why it is being called the serpent power. Serpent is actually the name of Kundalini because Kundalini appears as a female serpent. That is why it's called Shakti. Shakti is the female aspect and Shiva is the male aspect. I'll tell you more about this later, right? So he came up with this serpent power. Obviously, research going back to Hindu manuscripts, Hindu scriptures and Hindu literature, right? So it is not a Western concept. It is completely, completely taken from Eastern um, literature, Eastern philosophy, Eastern yogis, Eastern rishis, all this coming from there, right? Of course, the basis of Hinduism, right? And uh, the second book about 10 years after that by Charles uh, Leadbeater, he wrote a book called The Chakras. And in there, he spoke about the seven chakras. But in talking about the seven chakras, right? This is where the terms were added. Like before that, you know, there was no specific identification of where each chakra is located. Of course, the identification is there from a Sanskrit perspective, right? So this information was taken and then they said, right, so the Muladhara is the root chakra. It is based at the base of the. Then you have the solar plexus, you know, you have the, the abdominal, then you have the heart, then you have the throat, then you have the, you know, the third eye. Third eye again, you know. Third eye is coming from where? It is an English word, yes. But the concept of third eye doesn't exist in the Western philosophy, Western religion, Western culture. It is again from the East, right? The eye of wisdom, you know? It's where you get the Jnana Drishti from. The ability to see things which is not normal. So you get paranormal, you know, visions, visualizations. So this is the starting of the Western philosophy, right? I mean, of course, the Western philosophy came and they, they developed other psychological attributes and a wide range um, of other connecting factors to the chakras like alchemy, astrology, gemstones, homeopathy, Kabbalah, tarot, you know, all this was developed by the West, right? Certain things, very few things are mentioned in the... Um, Eastern manuscripts, right? In the books of uh, the Vedas or the Upanishads, very uh, little reference is gathered in relation to alchemy or astrology or gemstones or homeopathy or Kabbalah or tarot or things like that. 
again, as I said, is developed from the uh, Western side. I mean, and, and sadly, right, sadly, it's something that we all should <laughs> recognize and accept that many of us, right, uh, uh, many people, right, say us, um, uh, tend to go, you know, and do a bit of research on the internet and get whatever we can. And then that is used as the basis of knowledge. This is without any reading, without any research. And then we go to this one day course, three day course, seven day course, right? Which is all done by companies with a Western twist, the Western philosophical twist with the Western education, you know, all of that comes. Now I can tell you from experience, um, you know, I joined one of these courses. Uh, it's a fee-based course, the three day course. Uh, entitled Science Behind the Chakra Meditation. It was in London some 10 years ago, or I can, if I can remember correctly, right? So I walked in there and then they had um, an Indian professor from India. He brought in, he just gave an introduction, right? About what is chakra and all of that. And then he left after 15 minutes. Uh, we never saw him after that. The next uh, you know, the next uh, events that followed in the three-day course were all local people, right? Mostly natives. <laughs> the funny thing was the people who were delivering the course were all, you know, English or European. Uh, and the people who had who were attending the course were all mostly Asians, right? Of a Hindu extract, if you like, or a Buddhist extract, if you like, or a Jainist extract, if you like, right? I think there was only one um, English person I saw in the course. It had about 80 odd people, right? There was only one English person I saw. When I spoke to him, he's a reporter. He's trying to report on, you know, what is being taught there. Now, I sat through the first day, but I never went back for the second day or the third day because it was one, it was extremely basic, very elementary, right? And what they were saying were all completely, you know, misplaced in terms of belief or there was no real solid authority for where they are getting stuff from you know it was just so completely you know if i want to say it in one word it's completely detached from the actual authentic you know chakras as stated in the vedas and the upanishads and all of that i said no no i'm not stating that chakra means wheel so it can mean the wheel of time it can mean like in buddhism you have the dhamma chakra you know Dharma chakra is the wheel of dharma. And then, of course, you have the Kala chakra, which is the wheel of time. So chakra is something that connotes a shape that is circular. Right? So if you give it a, uh, if you give it a, a, a vertical posture, you can see the wheel with the spokes and all of that. But if you give it a horizontal picture, you can only see a circle. You cannot see what is in the circle, right? So the chakras, as far as the chakra system is concerned, is based on a horizontal placed chakra. That means it is lying flat. And you've got seven flat chakras of seven flat, you know, wheels at different points in your body, right? I mean, if you take Buddhism, the Theravada Buddhism, you know, the, the Pali, Pali is the, is the language. Um, chakra means wheel. And of course, Sanskrit is chakra, right? If you take the, uh, the Tripitaka, uh, another Buddhist uh, variant of belief, it's called Dhamma Chakra, or the wheel of Dharma. In Jainism, that is also references to chakra, right? Um, especially if you look at uh, the esoteric theories um, for the Jain extract called Buddhi Sagar Suri, right? Buddhi Sagar Suri, they means they talk about uh, chakras as a yogic energy center, right? This is Jainism. So it's 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 it comes from Hinduism, but it's gone into other faiths exacts, uh, ex uh, as well, right? I mean things like. Uh, you talk about the shapes in different extracts, right? The chakras can mean either a, a circular shape or a square or a triangle or a half moon or a dumpling, right? These are quite uh, apparent in, in, you know, Buddhism, Jainism, uh, Shintoism, uh, Confucianism, Taoism, Christianity, 
you know, I was doing this research, right? I found more than 300 websites, which is purely uh, dedicated to, you know, the Christian religion, the Christian belief, the Christian philosophy, but with a, a page or two or three on chakras, right? So it, it's there. I mean, it's, it's um, also, if you look at, um, you know, um, the, the Hindu references in the Rig Veda, where, where chakra is referred. If you look at uh, chapter 10, in, in Rig Veda, on the 10th mandala, if you like, right? It talks about a renunciate female yogi, right? Chapter 10, I think it was 136 of the Rig Veda, talks about a renunciate female yogi who was called Kunnam Nama. Kunnam Nama. Kunnam Nama, right? Now, Kunnam Nama in Sanskrit means one who is bent. Bent at... You know, I think one of the, uh, uh, during the Ramayana or one of the Upanishads, I spoke to you about Ashtavakra, the Rishi Ashtavakra, who was the guru for uh, Janaka, King Janaka, right? And he was bent in eight different places like this. In the Rig Veda, in the 10th Mandala, verse 136, refers to a renunciate female yogi called Kunnam Nama. Now, she is the original reference and many people have referred to her, including, right, my own Atma Guru, uh, Sri Adi Shankaracharya, right, that she is the one who is referred to as Kundalini Shakti. Kundalini Shakti means Kundam Nama, who, as a result of, you know, going within, renunciate yogi, so you should know, right, going within, she managed to develop this energy which aligned all her chakras and she finally opened up at the Sahasrara and merged Samadhi. When you open your Sahasrara, that means you are fit for Samadhi or you actually gone into Samadhi, right? So no one can be life and kicking, so to speak, right? When their Sahasrara opens, <laughs> right? That is the ultimate. So no one can say I've activated my Sahasrara and still be alive in this world. Right? Has to be a, a super, 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 super yogic power to do that. Right? And unless you are evolved at that level of being, uh, you can't activate your chakra, the Sahasrara chakra, and still be alive in this world. Right? It means samadhi. A post samadhi, of course, you can travel as energy anywhere, anywhere. Eh? That's a different thing. But if you look at the Kundalini Shakti, now let me talk something about Kundalini Shakti, as I said I would in, in the last uh, session, right? If you look at the Upanishads, and I've mentioned this in the Upanishads, when I covered the Upanishads with you, uh, again, going back to the first millennium BCE, right? They are, they are called breath channels, right? Or prana shakti as opposed to, you know, psychic energy chakra theories, right? But the nadis, right, the breath channels, the three nadis uh, are central to this concept, right? The Ida, Pingala, and Sushumna. Ida, Pingala, and Sushumna are the three main nadis. Now, if I can ask you to visualize this, right? Assuming the, the Sushumna is the single rod going straight up, and that is your spine. Okay, that is your sushumna. Then on one side, there's ida, and the other side of the spine, there is pingala. So ida, sushumna, pingala, or pingala, sushumna, ida, right? Whichever you put it, it doesn't matter. Now, the straight one is permanent, but the ida and the pingala tend to cross each other and coil upwards towards, you know, the final point in your sushumna, which is the sahasrara. So you can visualize that, right? It's quite easy. Sushumna is in the middle, pingala on one side, ida on one side, and both are coiling around the sushumna. Now that is Shiva and Shakti. Ida, Shiva, pingala, Shakti. They are connecting with each other. That means they are merging and they are touching 
each other in different points as they revolve right around the Sushumna. It's actually a specific Upanishad for this called Shurika Upanishad that talks about the Nadi and how the Nadis work. I told you it's a science. Everything is a science, right? So the Shushumna is central, Ida and the Pingla, the Shiva and the Shakti. Of course, you know, the early Upanishads don't refer to them as psycho-spiritual vortices. They actually believe them to be. It's not a, a mere mention. They actually believe them to be psycho-spiritual vortices. You know what is a vortice, right? A vortex. It is a means to go into something that will take you somewhere else. Right? And of course, from a tantric perspective, you got the prana, you got the vayu, you got along with the nadis. Again, you can use this to evolve. Now, it's not just uh, us, right? If you look at the uh, Chinese acupuncture, ah, your Chinese acupuncture, Chinese treatments in acupuncture and um, all the other things that they use, they use they are, the Chinese system of meridians is exactly the Hindu Nadi system, is exactly the chakra system, right? This is how they have developed it. It's an extract. Then they develop it and use their own little, you know, um, forms of reference there. So it is not just, a, 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 you know, something that is peculiar to Hinduism. Of course, the base or the, you know, authenticity comes from Hinduism, but later it has been taken, extracted, developed, you know, and programmed into different types of things and it's sold in different ways, right? But as far as we are concerned, we are looking at chakra and kundalini. If you can imagine, the kundalini shakti is like a serpent. I told you where that name came from. Just lying coiled up at the very base of your first chakra, which is your muladhara chakra. It is just lying there. A serpent is a very powerful um, energy, right? Can you imagine if the serpent, instead of lying there latent, you, as a result of your own endeavors, as a result of your own spiritual practices, as a result of your own tapas or penance, discipline, you awaken that serpent and it starts to coil around the chakras. And the moment it touches the muladhara, you know, that is activated. The moment it touches the sadhisthana, the anahata, you know, like that, everything, it will start to go. Now, if you awaken one chakra, then the next stage is to awaken the other chakra, then the other, then the other, then the other, then the other. So one must be ready for this journey of, you know, spiritual awakening or spiritual evolution. There's no point just thinking about it, thinking, ah, it will be nice to do this. No, once you're on that journey, it must be one single continuous journey until you reach the top and you're finished. So, and, and really, you, you cannot be wanting this if you're still having wants and desires and needs at a material level. And this is a clear divide between the karma kanda, as I always say, and the jnana kanda. Once you cross over, there is no return. So make sure that you've had enough of this and then you want to traverse in that other path. Then you can, right? You go into dhyana and... I'll tell you how to do that in a, in a short while, right? So as far as, uh, um, you know, there's a yantric way, there's a mantric way, and there's a tantric way. And then if you go to one path, you know, one path is dhyana yoga. In dhyana yoga, there is also another way in which chakras can be awakened, right? So now you can see the connection between yantra, mantra, tantra. Pancha koshas, as I told you, first annamaya kosha, right? Of course, now going back to the first Annamaya Kosha and Pranamaya Kosha, Mano, Manonmaya Kosha, Pranamaya Kosha, and then Vijnanamaya Kosha and Anandamaya Kosha. Of course, if you don't control your food, then your chakras are going to be affected by it. Right? Yes, yes. The kind of food you eat can affect the energy in the chakras. Isn't it? If you have some heart problems, the, 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 the cardiologist will tell you what you can and what you can't eat. If you continue to eat what he's told you that you can't eat, then you're going to have problems. So like that, chakras are energy centers. And if you don't put the right energy in there, then of course, you know, it's like a 100, 100 watt bulb, but it's only burning at 5 watts. So can you imagine? It's burning at 5 watts, but its potential is 100 watts. 
So if you give it the right food, it will slowly go 5, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and then boom, at 100, you're fit to go to the next level. Like a lift. If you press number seven, it stops at the floor number seven. If you press 11, it stops at 11. If nobody is going, then you can press the top one. It will take you where you want to go. Likewise, chakras, you have to go to the first floor, second floor, third floor, fourth floor, fifth floor, sixth floor, and then only you can go to the seventh floor. It's, it's not the same concept. You know, you press seven, it, just, it takes you up. And from a tantra perspective, right, there is a specific uh, book called uh, Rudra Yamala. Rudra Yamala Tantra, which says each chakra has got a deity and has got a yakshin. Yeah, like a yogini, a yogini that can give you yogic access to that particular chakra. I also come to a sound. Each chakra has a sound. Each chakra has a color. Each chakra has a shape. Each chakra has a beach akshara mantra, right? So it's very powerful stuff, right? For example, if you look at the Rudra Yamala Tantra, it says the Muladhara, the yogini, right? The goddess who can give you the yogic power to gain access into the Muladhara Chakra is called Yogini. For the Swadhis Swadhisthana, she is called Dakkini. For the Manipura, she is called Rakini. For the Anahata, she is called Lakini. Fifth one, Vishuddha. She is called Kakini. And for the Agnya Chakana, she is called Shakini. The crown, the Sahasrara does not have anybody to protect it because once you've hit the sixth one, if your third eye is open, then straight away you have connectivity, you know, supercharged to the final total liberation. This is where you only see light. Light, is, which is either white in color or light lavender. You know, that is the aura. Each chakra has a color, I told you, right? The aura, right? So now in the Western philosophy, those days the rishis could see this. Now you can even have cameras which capture, you know, aura, the signs of aura. Now that Maybe in a different session, we can look at that. But there you go. But of course, each chakra has got a sound as well. Like I told you always, you know, the Muladhara Chakra, the base chakra, the root chakra, the presiding deity is Ganapati and the Bijakshara is Gam. So if you want to awaken that, you know, there is a specific color that you need to be looking at and there is a specific mantra that you need to chant, which is Om Gam, Om Gam, right? So that can awaken the even I told you in the Ganapati Adarvashi Yusham, right? There is a reference to Ganapati being the deity, presiding deity for the Muladhara Chakra, where the, the word comes, Tvam Muladhara Stitho Zinityam Tvam Shakti Trayat Makaha Tvam Yogino Dhyayanti Nityam So you see, these are not just merely mentioned here or there. Everything has got a specific base, authority and authenticity, right? In which they have said, but of course, if you look at some of the, uh, you know, 19th and 20th century authors, uh, when they speak about chakra, certainly one very um, well-known and, and established author like uh, Sri Amit Ray, he talks about the existence of the 114 chakras in the body, right? And some of the uh, other gurus have also spoken about this, you know, from various uh, other uh, roads of faith. Uh, they've also spoke about the existence of 114 types of chakras, of which seven are potent. I told you two cannot be seen, the soul star above the Sahasrara and the earth star chakra be, be beneath your feet, right? So, uh, you know, I also uh, have said that, you know, in, in the divide of the, the entire Hinduism, so you have Shaivism, you have Vaishnavism, you have Shaktiism, you have Kaumaram, you have Ganapadism, you know, like that. So the worship of specific and only that specific. You've got Krishna consciousness, like that. You only worship that particular deity, and that particular deity is given the primus inter pares. That means, you know, the first among equals. There is no other than that one. 
So the chakra meditation or the chakra methodology is very prominent in Shakti worship. You know, if you follow the group of Shaktism, people who worship Shakti, this is where the chakra, the yantra, the kundalini, all that features very heavily in Shaktism. Right? But chakra in uh, the Shakta, Tantrism, you know, Shaktic Tantrism, means the energy center. Energy center from where you can build and give energy. So if you use Tantra, you can do Chakra Puja, where you're worshipping the Tantra. I told you the flat version of the Yantra is called the Chakra. If you pull the middle point upwards, and you can see a structure coming up, and that's called the Meru, you know, Shakti. And of course, at every point, there is a deity, which gives you access from one level to another level to another, level, finally at the tip, right? So this is uh, Shaktiism, also to do with uh, Chakra meditation. Now, from a Buddhist perspective, now the Buddhists believe that there are five, and these five chakras relate to the five Panchabhutas. Like they call the basal chakra and they say that it relates to the earth, right? Uh, and they say the deity that looks after it is called Amogasiddhi, right? And then the abdominal chakra, they said it relates to water. Panchabuddha is the water. And they say Ratna Sambhava is the deity who looks after it. See, at the end of the day, the concept is the same, right? The methodology is slightly, or the terms of reference is slightly different, but exactly the same uh, work is being done, regardless of what you call or how you refer to it. Then the heart chakra, they said, relates to the element of fire. And they say Akshobhya is the deity who is looking. This is from a Buddhist perspective, right? Then the throat chakra, they say wind is the presiding element. And they said Amitabha. Amitabha, most of you would have heard in, in, in Buddhist uh, um, manuscripts, um, is, is the deity looking after the throat chakra. And finally, the crown chakra is space. So the Panchabhutas, right? Earth, water, fire, wind, and space uh, is Vairochana. The deity is Vairochana. But of course, they also have uh, accepted the Bijakshara, the Bij Mantra for each of this, right? Like for earth, they say is Lam. For water, they say is Vam. This is Varuna, right? For heart, they say is Ram. For wind, they say is Yam. And for space, they say is hum, right? Of course, we say gum, lum, bum, rum, yum, hum, om, seven, yeah, from the Hindu perspective. So in, we, we have, in Hinduism, we say kundalini. In Buddhism, they say kandali, right? It means the same thing. So what I'm trying to say is it, it all started in one place and then it got absorbed it got extracted and absorbed. It got extracted, absorbed, and then re-extracted and reabsorbed until where we are today, right? So you can see the amount of dilution that would have taken place throughout all this time and space. But what I am telling you today is going back to the source, right? It's all Rig Veda, right? Now, let us talk about each one of the chakras now, right? And I'll, I'm going to tell you, you know, more information about what they uh, what they refer to right so if you're talking about um, the base chakra let's start with the base chakra right it's called the root in english or the base chakra in hinduism of course in sanskrit we call it muladhara chakra right where is it located the base of the spine you know the bottom part of the spine right if the top part the most the tip is Sahasrara, then the tip at the bottom is called Muladha. So both spine is covered. Very powerful. Of course, you know the importance of spine from a physiological perspective, from a medicinal perspective, you know how important it is. So it is located at the base of the spine. It is called Muladhara in Sanskrit, root um, in English. Color is red, right? Color is red. Now, what's the basic characteristic of the, the Muladhara? And, and what it says, uh, if I can say, instinctively, what does it refer to? 
the muladhara is all about survival you know to be here in the now present in the now so in a sense if you like it's all about self preservation right so if you're into gemstones normally you know they would uh, use like a, a red coral or something like that right but then again right interestingly again scientifically speaking the chakras and the navagrahas are highly related chakras are seven navagrahas are nine again in that nine two are seen as nodes rahu and ketu right similarly here you have seven but there are also nine the soul star chakra and the earth star chakra which are invisible so there is a fantastic scientific connection relativity between the chakra system and the navagrahas i think once or twice i have referred to the navagrahas uh, as a direct you know uh, connection between the chakras and the navagrahas so maybe the, that can be another session where we look at the connectivity between the chakra system and and the navagraha worship system right um now there are when you talk about the chakra right there are three consequences of each chakra either they are balanced and that is the ideal aim or goal or objective all the chakras should be balanced or they are on either side right either they are deficient or they are excessive so i'm going to talk about the chakras each one of them how they should be balanced and what are the symptoms you can you can sort of you know look at if they are balanced if they are you know deficient or if they are excessive right so we are talking about the muladhara um, chakra right now if they are balanced right that means you are always grounded you know you are always in control of your your thoughts your words your actions you know you are balanced basically it means you you are you are calm that means your muladhara chakra is balanced right now if it is deficient what does that mean if it is deficient if it is deficient means you lack that self esteem or you lack that self control or you procrastinate a lot or it could be that you have uh, uh, i think i mentioned low esteem right or you have uh, insecurity issues or you know confidence um, you know low confidence issues that means your muladhara chakra um is deficient right um if it is excessive means yeah, well you talk about being highly uh egotistic you know you are selfish you are materialistic you know it's excessive that means overworking you know the focus is solely on things that do not matter you know in the afterlife the focus is on material um focus okay so that is the root chakra or the muladhara chakra the color is red it is located at the base of the spine i told you it deals with survival instincts of self preservation and uh, you know being in the here and the now and i told you how it should be balanced how it should be deficient or how you can see if it is deficient and how you can see if it is too excessive because you know yourself better than anyone else so if you identify or relate to any of the things i have said then you know whether you are balanced or on the deficient side or the excessive side right um then of course you the second chakra moving up now once you've developed a, a, a slight balance a slight balance in your muladhara and you've awakened it then you move to the second chakra and you start working on that that is the sacral chakra or it is called swadhisthana where is it located anybody i'm sure you all know it's located between you know the navel and the human genitals right it's in between there what's the color the color is color is orange orange and you know they they all have a shape um maybe i will i will send uh, uh, an a4 sheet with the color and the shape to brother ganesh and then all of you, all of you have registered um you know uh for the pranas it's important that you know this um 
and he can then e email it to to everybody right um so I'll, i will do that because it's difficult to explain the shape um because if i said you know it's circular or it's it's uh, it's in a triangle um you can imagine something but your imagination may not sit with how it actually looks um in in, in actual fact so i will do that um what what is the basic uh, basic issue relating to the sodhisthana well you know as i said the muladhara means to be here so this tana means to feel something so it deals with uh, you know um to feel means of course you know you have desires you know you have desires which can take you to uh, the very base of human existence you know where you're just thinking of um, you know uh, sexual gratification for example uh, that is where you know your your so this tana relates to directly or if you go to a higher level then the gratification moves from the self to everyone else right so a balanced swadhisthana is where you are creative you are friendly you are for example you know you are tuned to your feelings and you can discriminate between the base instincts going back to bhajo govindam right muda tehi hi danagama trishtam गुरु सद्बुद्धि मनसि वितृष्णाम यल्ल बसे निज कर्मोपातम वित्तम तेना विनोदय चित्तम मूव अवे फ्रॉम ऑल दिस बेसिक बेस डिजायर्स मूव टू द हायर सेंस ऑफ सेल्फ प्रिजर्वेशन फ्रॉम एन आत्मिक पर्सपेक्टिव राइट सो दैट इज अ बैलेंस्ड स्वदिस्थाना इफ इट इज डिफिशिएंट दैट मींस यू आर रिजेंटफुल यू आर शाय यू नो those kind of things will take place um you have a lot of fear um you know where you you uh, are very emotional that is where your swadhisthana is is technically deficient if it is uh, you know aggressive or it is uh, excessive then of course you 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 are seen as an aggressive person you are you make use of others you abuse your dominant position um you know you um have high emotions you are driven by emotions you are driven by self serving intentions you are manipulative that means your swadhisthana is highly active right too active excessive it's not balanced remember we want a balance so a balance always is in between the deficient and the excessive so that is swadhisthana the third one is manipura or the solar plexus where is it located you know it's below the sternum and above the navel below the sternum and above the navel right at that midpoint and of course the color is yellow and it's called manipura right manipura again a word that often comes up in the buddhist scriptures okay now what is the characteristic so muladhara was to be here to be in the here and now so swadhisthana was to feel uh solar plexus is to act so it talks about the power that you have to do things right and how do you build that power um if it's balanced then you are a joyful character you know you've got good self esteem you've got strong personal power you are relaxed you're multi skilled but if it's deficient then of course you lack that personal energy you suffer from low esteem uh your self conscious at times confused you know you have insecurity issues or if it's too excessive then you are a workaholic you know you're resentful you're authoritative you know you like to impose your superiority um you know sometimes uh i also think it's you know being very highly intellectual where you forget uh you know uh, to have a right sense or to be sensible about that intellectual capacity that you have so that can mean that your uh, solar plexus or your manipura is not balanced okay good um i'm doing this slowly so everybody gets um, you know gets it right uh, the fourth one moving up remember we've just covered the three lower chakras right the root muladhara and the sacral which is the swadhisthana and then the solar plexus which is the manipura these are called the lower chakras 
Now let's do the upper chakras, starting from the heart, Anahata, the Vishuddha, the throat, Agnya, the third eye, and the Sahasrara. So talking about the heart chakra, green is your color, right? Green is your color. In fact, I think in, uh, in Harvard, they once did a test for heart patients where, you know, they actually painted an entire ward green, you know, all the nurses uniforms, the doctors, everything was green, a light sort of green, you know, uh, with a touch of pink here and there, right? And, you know, the food was served in green trays. Everything was green, 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 green. So people had no choice but to focus on green so much. And they found amazingly, and this is documented, right? They found amazingly that it expedited the recovery process by 34%. 34% faster recovery than other heart wards or cardiac wards where this, uh, this experiment was not being done. Can you imagine? And this I'm talking about, you know, in 1970s or 1980s, this is being done. Whereas, you know, our rishis have already said, you want to look after your heart, meditate green. Meditate green. Right? Green color. So the heart talks about to love. Of course, heart, love, you know. This is the characteristic of this chakra. The heart chakra is to show love, to show compassion. So how do you know if your heart chakra is balanced? Well, if you know your heart chakra is balanced, you will know it when you can show unconditional love. Love all, serve all, as he says, you know, where you are emotionally balanced. Heart chakra is balanced. Where you are empathetic, you know, empathetic and sympathetic. I covered both of these terms, right? Empathy and sympathy in my reflection series. So go back there. These are all available on the uh, YouTube channel, embodimentsoflove.org. So you can go back and, and, you know, have a like a revision. So where you're compassionate. So if you're always wanting to help people, that means your heart chakra is balanced. But you know, your heart chakra can be balanced, but your chakra below may not be balanced. So unless they are all balanced, you will have, you know, balance issues. <laughs> You'll have imbalance issues rather, right? So that's why I say you start with your muladhara. But if you're balanced already at the heart, then you don't have a problem, right? You start with your muladhara, work to your swadhisthana, then the uh, manipura, then the anahata, the heart, then this, the shuddha, then the agnya, then the sahasrara. Okay. Now, if your heart chakra is deficient, then... You know, you can, uh, you can see, for example, if you suffer from paranoia, you know, paranoia, right? Um, if you suffer from indecisive feeling, you cannot make a decision, or if you feel unloved, or if you feel, you know, sorry for yourself, you're afraid of letting go, you know, they say, let go, let go. If you're afraid to do that, then your heart chakra is actually deficient, imbalanced. On the other hand, if you are very critical, you are very, you have lots of mood swings, you know, you are possessive, you are demanding, you are a manic depressive. Also, the time you are full of tense, you know, tension, tension, tension. That means your heart chakra is highly excessive, not balanced. Either it's imbalanced, balanced, or completely not balanced, right? So I use the word deficient and excessive and use the word balance to show what it should be. Okay, so that is the number four, heart chakra or your Manipura. Then we move to the throat, the fifth chakra, which is your throat chakra, also called the Vishuddha. Vishuddha is based right here, you know, at the base where your shoulder and your neck meets. You know, there's a little, like a little, uh, little groove there. Uh -huh. That is where it is based, right? And that is why you always see me wearing the Rudraksha right at that center, because the Rudraksha has got certain energies, right? <laughs> it's not some people may think, oh, this guy is showing that he's wearing a Rudraksha. No, no, no. I always wear it at this point, this point here. Why? Because it sits at the base of the Vishuddha Chakra. And the energy from the Rudraksha will penetrate into the Vishuddha and further energize it. Right? That is why you see some rishis, they will tie Rudrakshas or they will tie different types of talisman. This is Tantra right, at different parts of their body to give them different energy, right, the different exposure. And that's the reason why, okay. Color, I told you heart is green. Throat is blue. 
right? And of course, we can even go back to Shiva and say Nila Kanta, one with the blue throat. But that's go back. That goes back to the Puranic story of again, is it Puranic story of him swallowing the halhala poison as a result of churning the ocean of? Right? You know, I'll come back to that when I do uh, Shiva Puran, right? So the color of the Vishuddha is blue. Um, to speak is the character. Of course, throat, voice, you know, speak. So to be here, then we looked at to feel, then to act, then to love. Vishuddha, to speak, fifth chakra. Okay, Balance means you are basically a, a very good speaker. You are artistic. You are, you know, eloquent. You know, you're, 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 you're easily exposed to experiencing divine energy because of that level of exposure you have. Uh, of course, if it is deficient, that means you are inconsistent. You're unable to express yourself as you would like to. Um, you know, there's so much of conflicting thoughts. You find yourself, you find yourself unreliable sometimes. You find yourself subject to being manipulated or, you know, sometimes a covetism uh, is also there. Of course, if it is totally imbalanced or excessive, then you're self-righteous, number one. Number two, you speak too much and uh, it doesn't have a specific goal or aim. You just talk too much, right? Talking excessively. You're arrogant and you are not open to um, other people's opinions as much as you should have. And you tend to force your opinion, you're domineering in that sense. So you know that your Vishuddha Chakra is, is imbalanced completely, okay? Um, now, if you believe in gemology, then I can talk to you about, you know, wearing different gemstones, but just wearing them is not enough. You know, you've got to empower them. And the way in which the stone um, is crafted into the ring, you know, some people do not know how to do it. So the, the um, you know, the, the um, for example, the jewelers or the people who sell these rings, right? It has to be an open thing that the stone sits there. Half the stone is on top of that and the below half will, should be touching your fingers. There's nothing there. It's not a, a complete base and the stone is placed on it. This is how most people sell it, right? That, that's not the way to activate the gems that you are wearing. The gem has to touch your body. So it has to touch your finger, right? Wearing the ring does not mean it touches you. That means the part where the stone is placed, it has to be an empty circle. So you just place it, half of it is at the top, half of it at the bottom. The bottom part is actually touching your hands. Yeah, that's a separate thing, gemology, right? Now, that's the uh, Vishuddha, right? Now let's talk about the third eye, the Agniya Chakra, which is right here. You know where you see, I put my uh, Shiva Shakti sign there, right? Chandan, Shiva, Kumkum, Shakti. Then I put a, a, a black dot. Uh, the black dot is where uh, the Shiva Jnana sits. That is the Jnana Khan, or that is the third eye, as they say. To see, that is the characteristic of this chakra, to see. So I've told you a characteristic of each of the chakra, right? The base one is to be here, rooted. Then to feel, then to act, then to love then to speak, then to see with the Agnya Chakra. So what you can see in both these eyes is limited to what the world can show you. But what you can see with the third eye, when that chakra is activated, is beyond this world. You go into paranormal, parapsychology. Hmm? Right. Balanced means, number one, you are non-materialistic. Ah, very important. Non-materialistic at all. Then, of course, you have no fear. You have a certain charisma oozing. You know, there is a certain light that comes out of it. This is called tejas, right? Total vision. You're master of your own senses. And sometimes you have telepathy. I told you it works, right? But some, some of the things I say sometimes, I myself don't know when I hear it subsequently. I said, ah, I said this. But I didn't know this. I didn't read it anywhere. Nobody told me. I didn't get it from anywhere. So how is it that I, it is possible for me to give this in a life satsang, in a life pravarchan? Telepathy. It will come when your channels are open. It will definitely come when your channels are open. This is the science. 
the cosmic energy. I told you, at a conscious level, your energy is different. At a subconscious level, your energy is different. At a superconscious level, your energy is imaginable, unimaginable, actually. You know, it is, it is amazing. Amazing, right? And anyway, you know, you have to experience it for you to know the extent of how much, you know, joy it can give you. You know, it's just, and there's no parallel to it. Again, if your Agnya Chakra, your third eye is inactive, that means it's, it's, you know, it's completely imbalanced, then you're undisciplined. You know, you have, uh, you are weak in terms of uh, your needs. You focus on the wrong things. You are afraid of doing something different. You know, you are so used to your, what, what, what do they say, the comfort zone? Ah, that one. You don't want to change. You know, change is the only permanent thing. So get used to it. Hmm? Get used to it, then you'll be fine. If you are accept, if you are good to accept changes, then you, you won't have a problem at all, right? Now, on the other hand, if it is totally imbalanced, then again, you're egotistical, you're arrogant, you're manipulative, you know, you, you are dogmatic in your approach. And of course, you think of yourself at one level and you look down on others and your Agnya Chakra is completely imbalanced, right? um amethyst you know the color is indigo indigo or light light uh light lavender you know light lavender focus on that imagine so i say when you close your eyes imagine it's either white or light violet or light indigo you know indigo so that is your sixth chakra now let's talk about the king the king of the chakra the sahasrara sahasrara means thousand so what is the connection between thousand and, and this chakra? Uh, remember I said to you, every chakra is like a flower. What I didn't say was, how many petals does the muladhara have? Right? How many petals that the, you know, uh, swadhisthana has? So it starts from a low, right? Then it starts to develop, you know, like nine at your heart chakra. Manipura has nine petals. Swadhisthana has 16. Agnya has 32 petals. And this one has thousand. So the power increases, the number of petals blossom like that. Color, it is, of course, it is based right there in the top of your head. Now I'll come back and talk to you about medicinal science and what that says about where the Sahasrara is located, signs of medicine. So uh, doctors, you will, you will know what I'm talking about more than everybody else. Uh, top of the head, color is white, while well, I said violet. Mm -hmm. To know is the characteristic. To know, so to be here, uh, to to feel, uh, to act, to love, to speak, to see, here, yeah? to know. Everything is no. No. To know means you must have the knowledge. To have the knowledge means you must be disciplined. To be disciplined means you must follow some prescribed methods. So everything is linked in that sense. How do you know if your sahasrara is balanced? Well, you're an alchemist. There's no fear, right? No fear of death. Hmm? Nirbhav, nirve, akal murat, ajuni seba. I spoke to you about last week, right? No fear of death. You accept that miracles can happen. And indeed, you work with miracles, right? And you work for the universe. You are a worker for the universe. So the universe works through you for the benefit of others. So you are a divine energy. You become a divine energy when you get that level. If your sahasrara is imbalanced, your chakra is imbalanced, you will know because again, you're indecisive. There is no creativity. You are just, you know, not moving latent, you know. Um, indolent. Indolent is the word I'm trying to look at. No joy of life. Uh, you're full of melancholy, if you like, you know. Or if it is totally imbalanced, you know, too excessive, then you are frustrated, all the time frustrated, you know. You are uh, a manic depressive, right? And this is what the sign says, the signs of chakra, going back to the Upanishads, going back to the Vedic scriptures, going back to the Shastras, which actually refer to the uh, actions of uh, a fully vibrating chakra and an actions of a fully latent or indolent chakra right uh, you again you know 
most of you suffer from migraines or consistent headaches. That is a sign of a totally imbalanced um, uh, your crown, you know, your sasra rise. That means you have unrealized power and that may be a sign for you to say, how can I reverse this? And everything is reversible, right? Everything is reversible, okay? Quartz is a stone if you want to look at. So quartz is the stone you use for that. Uh, chakra, um, the Sahasrara Chakra. Amethyst is what you use for the third eye. Agnya Chakra, you want to use uh, azurite uh, that you use for your Vishuddha. Heart, you can use uh, rose quartz or, or rhodonite or tourmaline. Um, and then for your... Uh, Manipura, you can use um, citrine or golden topaz, um, amber, you can use for sacral. And of course, I told you, you can root rip jasper, garnet or red coral for, or ruby for a uh, base chakra, your muladhara chakra. So that is uh, in a nutshell, right? The different colors, the different, um, you know, um, reasons why uh, the, the, the chakras exist, you know, as to be here, to be able to see, to, to be able to talk, to be able to know, to be able to feel, to be able to, you know, all that seven chakra. You know, that, uh, the way in which you can affirm, make affirmations about this is corrective surgery, right? Through meditation. Meditation to, through mantra. I said, you know, mantra, mantra, tantra. You can use mantra. Mantra through something called affirmation. You know, when you get up in the morning. If, for example, you want to work on your Muladhara Chakra, right? You can do certain affirmations when you get up in the morning. For example, you can say, um, and you focus on your root chakra, focus a red background, and you can say, I am supported by Mother Earth. I am well rooted. That is a link between me and Mother Earth. I'm connected to my body in this sense. Most importantly, I have everything I need. Everything I need is given to me by Mother Earth, universe, right? So that is the kind of affirmation you do that can improve the balance of your root chakra or your muladhara chakra. Then the next one up is Swadhisthana, isn't it? What did I say the color was? You know, like mustard color, isn't it? Right? Not uh, sometimes they say orange, but you know, between orange and yellow, you get a mustardy color. Again, if you want to look at improving the balance of your um, balance of your so this tana, you can say things like, um, "I am a creative thinker. I am a creative being. I am a spiritual being on a human journey. I am balanced." I said to you, "I am a creative." You know, I said that. Yes, uh, my emotions are free and they are balanced. So that is the kind of thing you can say to empower your balance of your so this tana, your sacral chakra. And you move up to the solar plexus or the manipura. You can say, I accept myself unconditionally. That's a very good affirmation. I take my own decisions. I am responsible. I use my power for the good of everybody else. And in doing so, I honor myself. In fact, you can do all these affirmations one after the other, right? Then, of course, the heart chakra, Manipura, I said, Anahata, I said to use green color, right? I am kind and compassionate. I forgive myself and I forgive everyone else. I am grateful for everything that is experienced by me, good and bad. Right? Good things show me how to improve further. Bad things show me how to not to repeat certain experiences. I feel connected to a higher life through this compassion and my heart is full of love. Every day just say this and you'll find that your balance of the heart chakra becomes better and better and better. Throat chakra, blue color background. Against the blue, you are saying, I am an excellent communicator. You know, I am full of positive thoughts and full of positive spirits. For those of you who are budding singers, you know, like bhajan singers or kirtan singers, you want to become better, focus on your throat chakra and say, I'm a fantastic singer. I am a fantastic singer. 
I am a fantastic singer. Don't wait for others to tell you. You have to tell yourself first. This is called self-affirmation, right? I speak truth. Ah, another thing, right? I speak truth and I speak clearly. That means I speak with clarity. This over a period of time will balance your throat chakra. Then your Agnya chakra, as I said to you, is, you know, like indigo color, isn't it? I have a clear inner vision. My inner vision is very clear. I love my sense of intuition. My thoughts are very clear and very aligned. I make decisions clearly. I am a good decision maker, in other words, right? And I am open to higher energies and higher inspiration. Only then you move to the final, your crown chakra or your sahasrara and you say, I am connected to the universe. I am a part of that universe. I am a channel between earth and the universe. I love the oneness of the cosmic energy. I am true to myself and I live for a divine purpose. Continuous chakra. These are called chakra affirmations, right? Then you'll know that you are slowly, surely, and gradually getting there, right? If you want a single, you know, I can also give you a single, um, what do you call that, affirmation, right? So this is called the seven chakra affirmations, right? For, for your muladhara, you can simply say this, right? This one, one sentence, I am loved and supported, right? Actually, I can help you visualize this, right? So if you take an A4 sheet of paper, give it a red background, and then in white, you just write, I am loved and supported. So you, whenever you see this, you see the red background, but you see the white words, I am loved and supported. The same thing you do for your, for this tana, right? Or your sacral, I am creative and inspired. Orange background, white writing. Third one, yellow background, I am empowered. That is for your solar plexus. Hmm? Manipura. Fourth one, heart chakra, green color. I am love or I am peace. Or I am love and peace. Fantastic. Right. Then, Vishuddha is a blue color background. I am worthy of being heard. One sentence. I am worthy of being heard. Then, Agnya chakra, indigo or light violet. I am guided. Full stop. I am guided. Violet, background, one sentence. I am one with the universe. Now, in terms of the science and philosophy, right? Science and the philosophy of chakra, right? Or chakra, science, and philosophy. See, the Vedas are considered the basic philosophy. The chakras are considered the science of the inner body. Right, so there is a connection there. So according to chakra philosophy, the whole universe is perceived as being created, penetrated, and sustained by two forces, which are permanent and exist in a perfect, indestructible union. This is called Shiva Shakti, right? Force and energy, right? The atom, proton, you know, proton, neutron. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, this is also known as the principle of polarity in the chakra system, right? Principle of polarity. Biologically, it refers to the masculine and the feminine poles. Remember, I'm going back to the, the Shushumna Nadi, and then the Ida and the Pingala. I told you one is Shiva, one is Shakti, right? One is masculine, one the other is feminine. And only when the two forces of the universal aspects called Shiva Shakti or masculine, feminine, you know, they merge with each other in different, you have a balance. Otherwise, the Shiva will be vibrating at a different level, the Shakti will be vibrating at a different level, and then the Shushumna remains in balance. So when these two coil up against each other as they go around, there is a certain injection of balance, right? Shiva represents consciousness, Shakti represents Prakriti, your personification with the universe. And what connects them both is love, love and compassion. So that, that, therein lies the science, if you like, right? What about the uh, physics? I'll tell you the connection between chakra and physics. Now, 
in the <coughs> in the framework of modern science, right? The theory of relativity or the physics, when you look at the physics of the very large things, they are called macrocosm, right? And um, in terms of quantum mechanics, the physics of the extremely small is called microcosm, right? Now, according to the chakra system in these two worlds and beyond, right? The Shiva and Shakti are full, complete, and still independent, right? They are not separate, right? They are kindred in many, many ways just like fire and heat. One cannot exist without the other, other, right? Wind and the coolness. One cannot exist without the other. The moment there is fire, you will feel heat. The moment there is wind, you will feel the coolness. Likewise, Shiva and Shakti, hence the merging. Now, in the science of iconography, if you look at Shiva, one of the forms of Shiva is called Ardhanarishwara. That means half male, half female. I've spoken about this whenever I speak about the form of Lord Shiva. Again, you know, I have made many references to it. Um, Ardhanarishwara. So Ardhanarishwara is a symbol of cosmic balance. When the masculine pole and the feminine pole meet at certain places and are in full balance. And that is the Kundalini Shakti working up. So Kundalini Shakti very basically means where your energy is balanced and you are able to swirl up. Right? Now, from a medical perspective, right? This is doctors, as I said earlier, you know, you, you would be able to relate to this better than most of us, right? Chakras are absolutely linked to nerve centers, to glands and to major organs in the body, right? So the seven chakras are said to correlate with different abilities, expressions, health conditions and psychological states of mind, right? You see, chakras are basically two opposing forces right? One is positive, if you like, one is negative, and there has to be a balance, right? So one is, um, you know, one is called chakra excitation, you know, or ac ac active, one is called chakra inhibition, which is means it is subdued or it is suppressed, you know? Now, a balance between this state of excitation and this state of inhibition is crucial for there to be, uh, you know, a healthy cognition and behavior of the chakras or the the, the, the rejuvenation of the energy is very important, right? Now, to use uh, some medical references, you know what is glutamate and GABA, G-A-B-A, right? These are called two opposing neurotransmitters, right? When a brain is dominated by glutamate, right? That means it is only capable of exciting itself, you know, doing lots of things, you know, like when... You're running a sport, you're participating in a, you know, something that uh, has a price for the first, uh, first, first winner, second, like that, right? Burst of activity. This means the neurotransmitter that is working there is glutamate. Whereas GABA, it's uh, the opposite. You know, once I said it, one I said is excitation, the other is inhibition, isn't it? One is an exciter, the other is an inhibitor. So glutamate is an exciter, GABA is an inhibitor, it suppresses you. So quiet, soft activities with very little synchronization, right? But only when there is a balance between the glutamate and the GABA then the chakras can be activated, rejuvenated, energized. Likewise, a healthy brain thrives in the middle of these two extremes of glutamate and GABA being active or inactive. There must be a middle ground and this middle ground is where you know the divide between the left brain and the right brain you know uh, all, all of that comes in so it is very very highly connected with medical science right it relates to how you think and all of that so the chakra system is not something just uh, as a spiritual concept for somebody to go into meditation you know oh, oh, oh you develop your kundalini shakti oh you know, it is, it is spoken about more and acted upon very less. Once you know the science, then you can differentiate between the Kundalini Shakti, which is more related to your nadis, your central breath system. I also spoke to you when I did the breathing, how the, you know, Kuraka, Kumbhaka and Rakshaka relates to the Ida, Pingala and the Nadi, uh, and the Shushumna Nadi, right? So, 
it is a, a, a very, very, very ancient, powerful tool to get into the spiritual vortex. Right? And, and, and for most of you, all spiritual aspirants, it is fundamental for your spiritual elevation and spiritual progress. Anyada Sharanam Nasti Tumeva Sharanam Mamaha Tasmat Karunya Bhavena Raksharaksha Maheshwara Hari Om Tatsat.